Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Central Baptist Church. Uh, my name is Todd Doherty. I'm the student pastor here at Central. And to those of you who are online watching this, uh, welcome to you all uh, as well. If you are a visitor, we're really excited, particularly excited that you're, you're here to worship uh, with us. Um, like I said in the first service, the most important thing uh, about Central Baptist Church is that we are all about Jesus. We are all about uh, the gospel. We are a gospel-centered church. We, uh, we proclaim the gospel proudly, and we identify uh, in Christ, uh, who gave himself as a, as a substitutionary atonement um, for us so that we could have a relationship with our Father in heaven. Uh, so we, uh, you should have uh, gotten an announcement sheet if you are walking in. Uh, the announcement sheets have all sorts of in, uh, uh, interesting things going on, um, on in, our, in the life of our church. Even with the COVID mess, we are uh, moving forward with uh, a calendar as, as fall is approaching. And so we're really excited about a couple of the, uh, of, well, we're really excited about all the events that are happening here at Central. But I do want to give you guys uh, some attention to a couple of events events in particular. Number one, we are collecting candy for our greet and treat that happens every Halloween. Uh, it's just an alternative for families within our community to be able to come through here with their kids and uh, get some candy throughout our hallways and, uh, and just um, uh, enjoy the holiday, but also uh, uh, be in our church. And so we welcome that, but we are collecting candy now. And so we need a, a lot of candy. Uh, and so um, be thinking about collecting candy and bringing it here to the church uh, as October is quickly approaching. Uh, the second event um, that we have coming up as Fall starts to uh, uh, you know come around, and we start getting a little bit colder weather. The joy is that uh, Christmas decorations start going up, you know, in September. And so, uh, w with that though, our annual Christmas uh, toy store is happening. And so, our Christmas toy store is for families within our community uh, that just need a little bit of assistance getting Christmas presents for their children. And so, if you know anybody in your neighborhood, if you know somebody at work, students, if you know somebody at your school that you know know their families could use some help uh, this holiday season with getting Christmas presents for their kids. Um, now is the time to get invitations out. So in the atrium, you'll see a toy box out there next to the welcome desk. Um, there are these invitations and these invitations, they're actually right here on the screens for you as well. Uh, they have information for uh, these families. And so you can just give them one of these You can go to a business and hand out a few uh, or put them on you know, the counter or whatever. Uh, and you, uh, you can give these two people and uh, they will have the information necessary to um, sign up. And so what the sign up looks like is they come to Central on Thursdays from nine to four, uh, any Thursday from September, October or November, and they can sign up for the free Christmas toy store um, that will be a blessing for them. And uh, as as we are praying about this toy store this, this year, I hope that you all will be praying about getting involved. Uh, we will have signups available in the future, but we need a lot of volunteers um, to do the toy store. And so be praying about this ministry. Um, if you have any questions about the Christmas toy store, uh, ask a staff member, particularly Pastor Billy. He's the one that's heading up uh, this toy store. Okay. All right. Well, we are excited again to worship together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, we are about to stand and uh, just wave at each other, give each other fist bumps. But first, let me just pray before we enter into this time of worship. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. And Lord, we thank you for knowing you. You have made this relationship possible. And God, you demonstrated your love for us and that while we were still sinners, your son Jesus died for us. And so, Father, we respond in worship and praise. We worship you this morning. Lord, I pray that this service would not be about anyone on stage, but rather it would be about you. I pray that every heart in here would be in tune with the mission of what we're doing here this morning, that we would learn about you, that we would respond in worship to you, and that we would go out into our communities and into our daily lives and love people around us and bring them into the knowledge and truth of the gospel. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, we're gonna sing a song called Marching to Zion, which is actually out of the hymn book. It is a hymn, it's a little bit different. 
as you'll hear right now. Oh 
go to children's church at this time. Um, this morning is kind of a, a special morning. We're going to sing a blessing over you, but um, I want to make an announcement before we do. Uh, this Wednesday, we're going to start back handbells. So if you've been playing handbells or you're interested in playing handbells or just want to see me and talk about handbells, I'll be down front after the service is over and you can come see me about that. We, we play every Wednesday from 5 p.m. to 6 so just one hour there, and I'd love to have new people in the handbell choir. We'll be in the choir room. Don't worry. We'll be social distanced, spread out, not on top of one another, so we can just ring away and get ready, hopefully, for a Christmas program. But this morning, like I said, is a special morning. We want to sing. The ensemble wants to sing a blessing over you this morning. We want to sing, may the Lord bless and keep you through this season. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The 
Amen. We need the Lord's blessings. We need them indeed. Let me ask you to take your Hebrew songbook and turn to chapter 139. You did know that Psalms is a songbook, I hope. Psalm 139, right there in the middle of your Bible, if you would turn to that. As you're doing that, just a um, reminder to kind of look around. Maybe you've noticed uh, uh, one of our, our home team has not uh, been here lately. Maybe they've been in the other service. Make note of that. Give them a call. Encourage them. Make sure they're doing okay. Uh, and also, uh, we have plenty, plenty of seats here. Let's, uh, let's be inviting uh, our unsaved friends and family members and and uh, folks who are not going to church somewhere else. Now, don't go stealing somebody from somewhere else, but uh, uh, find somebody that's not involved and, and encourage them and invite them to come. And I also want to remind you that at the end of the message today, uh, if you have a need, you need someone to pray with you about, maybe concerning salvation or baptism, uh, uniting with this church or some other need that you may have, I hope you'll feel free to just come, and uh, I'll be around, Bill will be around, several of us will be around here, be happy to uh, pray with you and try to uh, encourage you. He was a pastor, an author. He was a preaching professor at uh, Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary and the Beeson Divinity School. Of course, I'm talking about Calvin Miller. Uh, Calvin Miller, early in his pastorate, was pastoring a small church, and at the same time, he was studying philosophy. Now, he got as confused as a termite in a yo-yo doing that. And he actually began to doubt the existence of God. He said, now normally that wouldn't be a problem. He said, but I was a pastor. He said, I preach better when I believe in God. <laughs> now, I hope you don't hold that against him. Some of you may not know that one of the great heroes of our faith, Martin Luther, toward the end of his life made a statement like, if there is a God, wow. You see, both of those guys going through difficult times, difficult seasons in their lives, I hope you know that pastors struggle just like other people do as well. That's why you don't ever want to put a pastor on the pedestal. We want Jesus to be on the pedestal, and we want to look to him, and we want our focus to be on him. But that being said, I agree with Calvin Miller. I preach better when I believe in God. And that's why we've kind of undertaken this little series that we're calling Knowing God as we're thinking about some of his uh, attributes. And of course, I mentioned to you that I'm kind of doing this in tribute to uh, one of my heroes, J.I. Packer. And uh, we, I've, I, this is the third week this has been up here on the screen. And you say, why do you keep putting that up there? Because I want you to get a copy of it and I want you to read it. Uh, I was tickled to find out this week that our, our young men, uh, thoroughbreds, uh, young disciples, uh, Kevin Hembry's group, they're going to get a copy, and they're going to they're gonna start reading through it as a group. I would challenge you to do something similar uh, to that. So that's why I keep mentioning it. It's good to learn some things about God so that we can get to know God better. It's that Important. The first week we looked at God's holiness, that is his otherness or his separateness from sin. Last week we looked at omniscience, which means that he is all-knowing. Today we'll look at omnipresence, which means he is everywhere present. Now, uh, I visited my, my doctor, Stephen Clark, this week, and he said, what is this with all these big words? and everything. And I said, well, listen, I said, every field of study has its own terminology. 
I said, you don't call your nurse and say, hey, go get me the thingamajig or the whatchamacallit. No, you've got a name for that. And uh, we may not know what it means, but they know what it means. Uh, but it's the same way in this discipline of, of theology, the study of God. There's some, there's some terminology, and uh, there's, there's big words in the Bible, justification, sanctification, glorification. And we can use those words as long as we explain those words, and that's what uh, my plan is today, is to explain to you what omnipresence is all about. But don't forget our principle for living. Gaze at God, glance at problems. You say, there you go again. Why are you bringing that up again? I want you to remember it. You're going to need it at some point if you don't need it right now. I'm assuring you that you will. Now, we're going to look... Um, Last week, we looked at the first six verses of Psalm 139, and I said that there's four sections of six verses. We're going to look at the second section today, so I want to ask you to join me beginning in verse 7. David is the writer, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 7, where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your right hand will lead me, excuse me, your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. If you're taking notes this morning, the first thing I want to say about this passage is God is present in every place. God is present in every place. There's uh, many definitions of the, for the word uh, omnipresence, but uh, the one that I came across that I wanted to share with you was from Charles Ryrie. Some of you may have his study Bible. He said this, omnipresence means that God is everywhere present with his whole being at all times. With his whole being at all times, God is everywhere present. In Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24, God says, am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? What's this verse saying? It's saying God is everywhere. You know, the pagans who worshiped the false gods, they thought maybe this false god was in control of this area, and they go to another area, and there would be another god in control of that area, and then they go to another place, and there'd be another god that was in control of that area. This verse right here is saying that God is in control of all areas. He is everywhere present. Another uh, definition that I ran across a little bit longer, but it says it in a little bit different way. God is omnipresent, which means he is fully present everywhere. He is not like a substance spread out in a thin layer all over the earth. All of him is in Chicago, in Calcutta, in Cairo, in Caracas, and I might add, in Crossville, at one and the same time. Amen. There is no place where God is not. Now, look at uh, verse 7. He asked a couple of rhetorical questions there. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? Now, the answer to that is nowhere. But the ideas of, of, of your, your spirit and your presence, they're, they're parallel ideas. If you're in the presence of the Lord, 
then the Spirit is going to be there. And wherever the Spirit is, you're going to be in the presence of the Lord. They go together. The Lord's Spirit manifests His presence, makes it known to us. He then goes on to give two hypothetical examples of places where He might go. Look in verse 8. If I ascend to heaven... You are there. If I make my bed and shield, behold, you are there. Now, he is present at the highest and lowest locations. He is present at the highest and lowest locations. We usually, when we think of heaven, we, we think of that being up. And when we think of shield, we think of that which is down. And actually, the, the Hebrew word there, shield, it, it, it simply means the place of departed souls or the place of the dead. It sometimes denotes a place of punishment, and other times it's just simply talking about the grave. But down, either way. Uh, the, the New Testament word that's the equivalent that you may be more familiar with is the word Hades. It's talking about the same thing. So if I send to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and shield, behold, you are there. Verse 9, he says, if I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea. Now, he is also present at the furthest points east or west. He's also present the furthest points, east or west. Now, if the psalmist moved at the speed of light, he took the wings of the dawn, he still could not get away from God. Now, let me ask you, which direction does the sun rise or the, the, the dawn rise on the day? In the east. He's talking here about the east. If he went to the furthest point to the east. And then he talked about the furthest point to the west. If I dwell in the remotest part of the sea. From their orientation and what they're thinking about. When they think about the sea. They're thinking about the Sea of Galilee. Excuse me. Not the Sea of Galilee. The Mediterranean Sea. That's the big body of water to their west. So he's saying here. Uh, that if I go to the east or the west, you are there. Now, uh, I ran across a, a term that, that I, I was not familiar with uh, called marism. Marism. And I think I have that uh, on your notes. And it's, it's a figure of speech where a pair of contrasting words are used to express totality or completeness. We actually saw one last week in the first six verses if you look in verse 2, he says, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. Now, that's not the only times that God knows is when we sit down or when we rise up. It's talking about all of our activity. And the same is true uh, in these verses. He's not saying that, that God is just present in heaven and God is present in shield. It's talking about everything in between. He's not just in the east and in the west. He's everywhere in between. So it's a figure of speech that's used to help us with that concept. God is in heaven and shield and everywhere in between. He's in the east and the west and everywhere in between. So you look back at verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? Nowhere. You can't get away from God. Jonah actually learned from experience that you cannot escape God's presence. You'll remember that God had told him to go uh, probably from where he was to the northeast to Nineveh to preach. What does he do? He goes the opposite direction. Verse 3 in chapter 1 of Jonah. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarsus, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarsus from the presence 
of the Lord. Verse 10, the, all the sailors found out, you know, what Jonah was doing, that he was running from God or trying to. Then the men, in verse 10, the men became extremely frightened and they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Now, Jonah could not escape the presence of the Lord. And I'm here to tell you this morning, you can't either. There is nowhere where you can go and get away from God. He is everywhere present. God is present in every place. Secondly, God is present even in the darkness. God is present even in the darkness. Verse 11 of Psalm 139. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. So God is not only in heaven and in shield and everywhere in between and east and west and everywhere in between, but he is actually in the dark as well. He made the light and the darkness, we learn in Genesis chapter 1, and therefore he is sovereign over both of them. Now, in verse 11, he says, if I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me. If you have an NIV or a New Living Translation, it uses the word hide. Uh, the King James Version uses the word cover. But this word overwhelm is only used a couple of other times uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, Genesis 3 and 15 and Job 9 and 17. And there it's translated as bruised. The word bruised. So Genesis 3.15, a first familiar to many, really the, the first presentation of the gospel, really. And I will put enmity between you, the serpent, the devil, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. That's the same word, bruise, the same word for overwhelm. Job 9, 17, for he bruises me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without a cause. Someone has suggested David spoke of the night as bruising him because it's often at night that harm comes to people. You know, darkness can sometimes refer to trying times or trials in our lives. You know, I can't see very well in the dark. Uh, it makes me think of, of when I was a kid. Uh, we didn't really go on vacation hardly anywhere, but my dad would take a couple of weeks of his vacation, and we would go to North Carolina to his hometown where all my cousins were, and I had cousins, a lot of them were kind of around my same age, and, and uh, for two weeks, I just, I'd go over there and play with them, and loved it. We'd play hide-and-go-seek, and, and uh, we were at my grandmother's house one time, and, uh, and I was running across her yard in the dark, and whammo, I hit my head on a hubcap hanging from a tree. <laughs> now, some of you are going, that explains quite a bit right there. Now, for our, our uh, students, a hubcap, it is a circular aluminum thing that would go on the wheel and cover up the lug nuts on your, on your vehicle, okay? For some reason, somebody had that hanging from a tree, and, uh, and I nailed it. You say, Scott, why did you do that? I can't see in the dark. I can't see very well. But God's not like that. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like he's got, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, 
night vision goggles. That just slipped me. Uh, it's like he's got really good night vision goggles. Even better than that, nighttime to God is, is just like the daytime. Verse 12, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. God's presence is everywhere, even in the darkness, even in our trials. Joseph in the Old Testament, he knew something about this. In Genesis 39, he had been sold into slavery. And in verse 2, it says, the Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Well, his master's wife uh, tries to ensnare him, and he ends up in prison as a result of that. Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Verse 23, the chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Now, God is with us in our trials. Think about this for a moment. We are probably more aware of God's presence during trials than we are at any other time. Now, for whatever reason, we're not always aware of God's presence. You know, have you ever, like, snuck up behind somebody? You know, you just, you just kind of snuck up behind them, and, and you're there. You're present with them, but they don't know it. They're not aware that you're present, even though you're standing right there behind him. So, are you a follower of Jesus? Are you going through some type of trial in your life right now? Know that God can see in that dark place, and he is there to comfort you. Call out to him. Call out to him for comfort during that dark period that you're going through. God is present in every place. He's present even in the darkness. And thirdly, God is present in each destination. God is present at each destination. Now, in verse 8, we see two destinations there. We see heaven and we see Sheol. Now, if by Sheol it's talking about the place of eternal punishment, that poses a big question. The question is this. Is God present in hell? Is God present present in hell. It may surprise you to know the answer, but it's yes. How could he be present everywhere and not be present in hell? But his presence is manifested in a different way than it is in heaven. Here was a, uh, another definition. Uh, the first part was a little wordy, I thought, Wayne Grudem. God does not have size or spatial dimensions and is present at every point of space with his whole being. That's basically what we said with the other definition. I like the other one better, but I like the end of this definition. Yet God acts differently in different places. Now, we've all been to a funeral service, no doubt. We've no doubt been to a wedding or a birthday party. We're present at the funeral. We're then present at a wedding or a birthday party. 
But we don't act the same in each place. You know, the, the, you know, cu- the, the fun and stuff that you're going to, you know, probably have at a birthday party or something, you're probably not going to do that at a funeral. Although I've been to a couple of crazy funerals. Um, but thinking of it in general terms, you act differently in different places, even though you're present in both places. Notice the contrast between God's presence in heaven and his presence in hell. First, he is present to bless in heaven. He's present to bless. In Revelation 21 and verse 3, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And then it goes on to talk about him wiping away every tear from their eyes. It's going to be an incredibly blessed place where we experience the blessing of God. Psalm 16 and verse 11, I love this verse. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. So he is present to bless in heaven, but then secondly, he's present to judge in hell. Also in the book of Revelation, chapter 14 and verse 10, this is talking about those people who have taken the mark of the beast. That's the he. He also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, those who have taken the mark, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone. Notice this in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now that's hard to swallow right there. But even in judgment, God's presence is going to be there, but it's going to be there in a different way than we think of it as being in heaven. The knowledge that God is everywhere present should be a comfort to those of us who have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But that knowledge, on the other hand, for the unbeliever should be something that should cause fear and trembling. It should be a warning to you. God is present in every place. He's present even in the darkness. God is present in each destination of which there's only two. Now, I've underlined a lot of stuff in Packer's book. There's one line that stood out to me that I believe I have in your notes that I think is something deserving of your meditation and thought where he says, living becomes an awesome business when you realize that you spend every moment of your life in the sight and company of an omniscient, omnipresent creator. If we dwelt on that and thought about that, I dare say it could change the way we live and we think about our lives. Because the truth of the matter is, is that is a true statement. You are always living in God's presence to some degree. And it's an awesome business when you realize that very thing. Have you ever thought about where God's presence was when Jesus was on the cross? Now, there is a sense in which He was absent. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Maybe God's presence was there and he just, in that moment, he couldn't realize the presence of the Father. But in 2 Corinthians 9, excuse me, 5 and 19, which I don't think is in your notes, Paul says, namely, 
that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. You know, last week I, I showed you a passage in the book of Acts about how even before the foundations of the world, God made provision for you and for me to have our sins forgiven. You know, I, I cannot think of a time that I did not know that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. I'm sure I learned it as a wee little fella. I, I, I can't remember the first time, but I do know that it was probably later as a teenager when I realized that Christ was on that cross dying for my sins. I knew that he was dying on the cross, but I realized he was dying for my sins. He was paying the penalty for my sins. He rose from the dead so that, that I could be forgiven of my sin if I would repent and place my faith and trust in him. Now, in this room today, I know, well, let me say this, I don't know everyone's heart. I don't know my heart a lot of the time. But it wouldn't surprise me if there was someone here that you may have never made that decision. You may have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Friends, I challenge you to do that today. Don't run away. Quit running away. You cannot escape the presence of God. You'll meet him in eternity one way or another. You, there's a turmoil going on inside of you and there is, there, is, there is a want to in your heart. You're like, I want Jesus Christ. I want to be forgiven. Then call out to him this morning and be saved. Be delivered from your sins. Place your faith and trust in him. Now, probably most people in the room have, you've already made that decision sometime, but maybe you're going through a, you're going through some deep waters. You're going through some difficulties. We all do. Someone has said, you're either going into a trial, you're in the middle of a trial, or you're coming out of a trial. Okay? It's true of all of us. But in that dark place, in that difficult place, God wants to comfort you. He wants to help you. Call out to him and say, God, I need you. I'm aware of you and your presence. And I need your help in this situation. Let me ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. I appreciate your attentiveness this morning. I would simply ask you this morning, to do business with God. Don't start thinking about something else because he is present. He is present in your life. If you need to be saved, then trust him now. Pray a simple prayer. Pray a simple prayer like, God, save me. I trust in you. God's people in the midst of a trial pray, God, help me. Search me. Try me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any hurtful way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. Father, I thank you for these friends who are before me today. Lord, I pray 
that you would work in each of our hearts. Lord, those who may be here that are struggling, they're trying to run away from you, but they can't. Lord, I pray that they would yield to you. They would yield to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Scott is going to come and he's going to lead us in a benediction. If God is dealing with you and you've got something you need to talk and pray about, I'm going to be right down here. I'm not going to run out the door. I'm going to stay right here and I'm going to wait for you to come after we sing. Scott. Let's stand. We sang this earlier, we can sing it together. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. You are dismissed.